Well, good morning, City Church. I am glad that you guys made the decision to join us in service today. And good morning, everyone watching online. I'm glad you made the decision to tune into our live stream. You guys made a great decision this morning. Now, that decision was based off of and preceded by many prior decisions before that, since you woke up this morning. You made the decision to decide to roll out of bed. You made the decision to decide what clothes you're gonna wear today. You made the decision to decide, what am I gonna eat for breakfast, or am I gonna skip it? You made the decision to do something about your morning breath. I, I hope that you made the right decision there. You also made the decision, should I make coffee at home or try the amazing coffee that's in the community center here at City Church? You should check it out, it's really good. All those decisions have led you to where you are right now. Now, our lives are built on decisions, and a uh, Columbia researcher, her name is Sheena Liangar, found that the average person makes around 70, 70 decisions in one day. So in an average 16-hour day, then when you're awake, by this point, you guys have probably made roughly around 10 to 15, maybe 20 decisions to get you where you are right now. Now, in the course of an entire year, you will make around 25,500 decisions in one year. Now, in the course of a lifetime, around roughly 70 years, uh, give or take, you will make around 1,788,500 decisions. Now, many of those decisions that you're gonna make are, are, are kind of arbitrary. They don't really have that much drastic impact on your life, but every now and then, you come across decisions in your life that will have a profound effect on you and potentially have an effect on the people around you. Decisions like, who am I gonna marry? Decisions like, uh, should I leave this job? Or decisions like, should, should I take this job? Decisions like, should I relocate my family? Decisions like, should I take this treatment for this illness? There's decisions on decisions that build who we are in our lives. A famous philosopher in the 20th century named Albert Camus is famous for quoting this, that life is the sum of our choices. And so if we put together all our 1,788,500 choices that we make in our lifetime, that is who we are. So if that's true, if, if we really are the sum of our decisions, then we should learn how to make decisions better. And if you're a Christian, being a Jesus follower should affect the decision-making process in your life for the good. See, as a Christian, the old ways of how we used to make decisions and decide on things in our lives should not be the same way they are now because Christ changes everything. And so if, if you change how you make decisions, the, the process of making decisions on things, it will change who you are. Now today, we're covering a passage in scripture uh, where we're gonna look at how the early church and the early church disciples went about making their first major decision as a church. And, and, and we're gonna see and analyze the methodology that they employed that I believe can, can serve as a blueprint, as a guide for us today so that we can make better decisions in our lives as well. Now, the title of my message this morning is The Art of Decision Making as a Disciple. And like I said, we're going we're gonna to analyze the methodology that the, the early church disciples used. And if we employ this method in our lives uh, that we're going to read about and learn about, uh, it will be very hard not to make, uh, it will be very hard to, to make the wrong decision in your life. It will help you to make the right decisions in your life. And so uh, if you have a Bible or, or you got your phone, download the Bible app, would you turn to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to go from uh, verse 12 to verse 26. Now, before, as you guys are turning there, I'm going to give you guys some background so we understand where we at, we're at in our series. We have started a new series, and it's going through the book of Acts in our Bibles. Now, we started this series on Easter Sunday, and uh, the book of Acts was written by a guy named Luke. Luke was a physician that became a disciple of Jesus. He became a follower and part of the early church. And he was very meticulous in his research and his recordings of Jesus' ministry. 
and he compiled his research and his recordings into a book that is known as the Gospel of Luke in our Bibles. Now, he was also very meticulous in his research and in his recordings of how the church grew after Jesus ascended to heaven. And he took th those, uh, those writings and recordings and he compiled it into a book known as Acts, which what we are reading today. Now, uh, Luke, he was a good friend of the Apostle Paul, and he traveled on at least one of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. So much of the things that we read in the book of Acts are first-hand accounts from Luke himself or second-hand accounts of him uh, interviewing people that were alive during the time of Jesus and the early church. So the credi it's high credibility, the things that we're reading out of the book of Acts coming from first-hand and second-hand accounts. Now, uh, we are going to dive into, over the next few weeks and months, the book of Acts, and we're going to see how the early church, the first church, the church that we are a part of today, how it started. And so, to refresh your memory on where we are in the events of scriptures to this point, Jesus was betrayed by one of his best friends, Judas Iscariot. He was one of the 12 disciples. Judas commits suicide, leaves 11 disciples left. Jesus is crucified, and three days later, something miraculous happens. He raise, raises from the dead, and, and he proves uh, to, to everyone that he is who he said he was, that he is the Messiah. Now, we learned uh, in the beginning of, of this series a few weeks ago that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he, he visited and was with the apostles, uh, the, uh, the disciples and the early church members and he, for the next 40 days, and he would teach them, and he would taught them about the kingdom. And last week, we learned when, that Jesus ascended up into heaven, and he gave two, two uh, directives to the disciples that were watching him ascend into heaven. He said, you disciples will be my witnesses uh, in here, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And number two, stay right here in Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And then he zipped up to heaven. Now, if you're a disciple and you just saw someone ascend into heaven, and he told you to do two things, you should definitely do those two things. And that's where the disciples are at right now. The early church is in a waiting period. Jesus just ascended into heaven, and they are waiting for the Holy Spirit to, to come, like he said. And so they're in Jerusalem at this moment, and this is where we pick up the, this, the, the next uh, verses in Acts. And so, turn to, to Acts chapter 1, verse 12, and before we read, let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for, for this record of history, Lord, that we can see uh, our lineage as a church, where we came from, Lord, and we can learn from the lessons that you taught them so that we can uh, apply them to our lives today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Would you speak? Amen. Starting at verse 12, Acts chapter 1. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had, been, had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the rewards of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out, and it became known to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akel Dama, which this, with that means, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who knew, know the hearts of all, 
Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So the very first decision that the early church had to make was who was going to replace Judas? Who is going to replace uh, the, Judas the traitor uh, since there is only 11 disciples left? Now, let's go back. And we're going to analyze their methodology of how they came to the decision. And if you came in today, you got a note sheet. This note sheet helps you follow along with the message. And the first point in your note sheets, we're going to, uh, we're going to find five steps to making godly decisions. And the first step is this. Make prayer primary. Make prayer primary. We read in verse 14 that, that the disciples, they devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The early church prioritized prayer. That's step number one. Now, quick side note. It is very significant that Luke records that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers were there among them. Because we learn earlier in scripture in Matthew 13 that very likely his family did not approve and rejected Jesus' ministry when he was alive. But to now list them as part of the disciples and the early church that they're, they're praying with them is remarkable. Now, if any of you have siblings, you'll understand this. Because there is no way that I would believe that my brother is the Messiah. No, no, no. I grew up with this guy, the bullying, he's shooting me with a BB gun and all that stuff. No, more like the Antichrist would probably fit. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. My brother's right here. You're not the Antichrist. But... <laughs> The brothers of, of Jesus, to think that he was the Messiah, of course, they're like, no way. Dude, you're not the Messiah. For them to switch and change their minds, something miraculous must have happened. And it did. Jesus rose from the grave. And they saw him rise from the grave and ascend into heaven. And because of that, they could believe, oh, he really is who he said he was. He is the Messiah. Uh, and two of his brothers, James and Jude, would go on and be, uh, be early church leaders and would even write books in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament for us to, to read. And so they were part of the early church movement, and they too were making prayer primary. The early church prioritized prayer because they mimicked what Jesus modeled. Jesus, before every decision, major decision in his life, he prayed. Before going into the desert to be tempted, he prayed. Uh, before choosing the 12 disciples, he prayed. Before going to the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. And so he modeled prayer, and now they were mimicking what he modeled. Uh, 1 Thessalonians says, 5, uh, 5.16 says, Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. So prayer should be pr primary in our lives. Now, World War II hero, Corrie ten Boom, had an important question that she asked, and it was this. Is prayer your steering wheel, or is prayer your spare tire? Let prayer be the first thing you do, not the last thing that you do. In, in, in this case, the early church started with prayer. You see, there's power in prayer, and we are benefactors uh, from these first 120 believers that made the first early church. We are benefactors today of their corporate prayer. The fact that we are a church today is because of the, 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 the roots that they sowed and what Jesus did through them. Now, there is power in corporate prayer, and we have been practicing it here. We just did it during worship, where, where we list up uh, uh, the prayer requests of our church, and we go to God corporately in prayer, and we petition God to answer these prayers. And I believe that, that together we pray and together we rejoice as we, we see prayers answered, and God, uh, through his will, will, will fulfill those prayer requests. Uh, there is power in our prayer, and prayer should be the first thing you do when coming to a decision. Not, not, uh, not because prayer unlocks this magical power to, to make what you want happen. God is not a genie. No, big prayer should be the first thing you do because it aligns your heart with God's heart. It's kind of like docking a boat. I don't know if there's uh, many sailors in here or people who, who uh, spend time on a boat. I've been on a few boats in my lifetime. 
And there's a technique when docking a boat, getting to shore, that, that you do. One of, the, one of the things that you do is when you're coming close to the shore, usually there'll be someone to receive you on the dock. And you take a rope from the boat and you throw it to the person that's receiving you on the dock and that person anchors you to the shore. And then you start pulling on that rope. Now when you pull on the rope, what happens? Does the shore get closer to the boat or does the boat get closer to the shore? That's what prayer is. When you throw up that line of prayer and you're praying, you're not pulling God towards your will to fulfill what you want. When you throw up that line of prayer, you're pulling yourself closer to God. He is the shore. He is the anchor. And your will is aligned with his. Now, prayer must be primary. The second step in uh, the making godly decisions is this. Study the scriptures. Study the scriptures. This was Peter's first act of leadership over the, the church after Jesus ascended. Uh, the uneducated fisherman, Peter, if you are, recall. This Peter was the one who began studying the scriptures and quoting verses. And in verse 15, we, we just read, Peter stood up among the brothers, and he said, the scripture had to be fulfilled of what the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand through David concerning Judas. Peter studied what was written, and he got God-given guidance from it. Now, we learn of the gruesome end of the traitor Judas, but we also learn that this was all prophesied hundreds of years prior by the King David in the Psalms, and, and, and Peter lists two Psalms. He lists Psalms uh, 69 verse 25 and Psalms 109 verse 8, uh, where it, it says, uh, it, it talks about this traitor and, and his office being, desolate, uh, being uh, taken away, and that another should come and take his place. And this all came from studying the scriptures. And so the decision to replace Judas was revealed by scriptures. And just like Peter studying the scriptures for direction and guidance, we too today should study the scriptures for direction and guidance in our lives. See, Hebrews 4 verse 12, it says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. The Bible is living and active. It is the most important book that you can own. It is the most important app that you can download on your phone because it is the living word of God. God uses the Bible to speak and more times than I can count in my personal life that the Bible has come alive where, where I was going through something, I needed some wisdom, I needed guidance and, or, and direction and the scriptures uh, became alive and verses would jump out of the pages exactly what I needed to hear, exactly the encouragement I needed, exactly the guidance I needed to push me in that certain direction that I needed to go. And I guarantee you that Christians here today have experienced, those of you who, 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 who spend time in the Word, who actually meditate on the Bible, who spend time in the, uh, meditating and, and, and diving in in quiet times, you have experienced that as well. That God's Word becomes alive and active. And if you haven't experienced that, you are missing out. You are missing out on, on an amazing thing that God has given us. His word, which is active and alive. And I challenge you to spend time, make time, open up your heart, and meditate on God's word. Spend those quiet times and watch him speak to you. Now, there's a famous acronym of the Bible, uh, and it's this B-I-B-L-E. It's the basic instructions before leaving earth. And I love that because that's really how we should also look at the, the scriptures, that it is, like, it is our operating manu operator's manual, it, how to go through this life uh, the best way possible. See, when you, make decision, when you come to a decision point in your life, let, let the scriptures be your compass that point to true north. And, and, and simply put, if the Bible says not to do something, don't do it. And if the Bible says to do something, probably best to do it. It's simple as that. Uh, many of us know the basics, right? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't kill anybody. But also, it's not just a book of don'ts. See, the Bible also uh, tells us what we should stand for, that we should be people that are marked by love, that we should be people that are marked by kindness, people marked by compassion and generosity, people who forgive, people who are peacemakers. 
Now, studying the scriptures, God will guide you, and he will direct you uh, in those decisions that you have to make in your life. Now, step three. So you start with prayer. You study the scriptures. Step three, use common sense. The early church knew what they needed to do. They needed to find a replacement for Judas. Uh, and Jesus started with 12 disciples. Now there were 11. How were they going to find the replacement for the 12th? Well, they used common sense. See, wh what did Jesus tell them right before he ascended up to heaven? He said, you know, he gave them the directive. He said, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses to all the earth, right? And so if they needed to find a replacement, they needed to find a replacement who was going to be a witness. And if you're going to be a witness, you have had to witness what Jesus did. And so they used common sense, and Peter laid out some common sense qualifications of who would be, uh, who could be the replacement. And he laid it out in, in verse 21. He says, one, it had to be someone who accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So that narrows it down. At the time, there was, it said 100, about 120, uh, and, and that's around a room this size, right? And so that kind of cuts it, uh, cuts it a, a bit. And then he says, there's another qualification. Uh, someone who was there at the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. The baptism of John, uh, that's when Jesus was baptized. That cuts it even more from that 120. In Luke 10, it mentions that there was around 70 uh, following Jesus by that point. So that cuts it almost in, ha in half. Now, uh, and, and then the third one is, it was someone who had to witness his resurrection. So after using common sense and, and, and narrowing it down with these qualifications, they came to two candidates, two people. They narrowed it down to two candidates. And it was Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice. I don't know why he has three names. He couldn't decide on one. Let's just call him Justice. And the second guy was Matthias. Now, using common sense, it's something that Jesus also uh, 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 encouraged as well. In Luke 14, verse 28, he gave an example in one of the parables, and he says, so for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Uh, that that uh, otherwise, when he's laid down the foundation and is not able to finish it, all we see him will begin to mock him. See, common sense. Use some common sense. If you need to make a decision, uh, try applying some common sense and narrowing it down and narrowing down the options. The disciples narrowed it down to those two candidates. Now, today, there's a, a psychotherapist named Tess Brigham, and she specializes in treating uh, mostly millennials in the millennial generation. And over the past five years, she found something kind of disturbing. There was a common struggle, a dominant struggle that was plaguing a lot of her patients. And what it was, was decision fatigue. And she said that many of her patients would come in saying, I have too many choices and I can't decide what to do. What if I make the wrong choice? That's what a lot of her patients were saying. See, decision fatigue, it's an understandable struggle when you realize the world we live in. We live in a world where, where there, are, there is 170,000 variations of how to make your coffee at Starbucks. Blew my mind, I couldn't believe it. There's 3,600 different movie titles to choose from from Netflix. There are 40,000 items to choose from in your average grocery store. And so if you take that mentality of abundance and, and into our everyday lives, uh, you can see how it will cause, and it has caused, anxiety and depression amongst people. Uh, psychologist Barry Schwartz, he wrote a book called The Paradox of Choice, and he argues that more people, uh, that there are more people likely to regret their choices if they have too many options from which to choose. They either make poor choices, or they make good choices but feel bad about them, or they refuse to choose at all, which is itself a choice. So narrow down your choices when you're making a decision. Uh, that's what the disciples did. Uh, prayerfully make a list of qualifiers. Pray about it. Make sure that it doesn't contradict the scriptures. And use common sense. Uh, and, and if a particular option uh, that, that is up for deciding on doesn't meet those qualifications, cross it off the list. For example, if you're going to buy a house, you should go in there with some qualifiers first, right? Is it in the neighborhood that you're okay with living in, 
right? Is it, is it big enough for this, enough rooms and enough space for your family and, and the future of your family if you're gonna grow? And most importantly, is it within your budget? Is the mortgage going to be uh, sustainable with your income? Because it's absolutely foolish if you try to buy a house you can't keep the payments for. Or uh, if you're thinking about careers, you should, or in career changes, you should go in there with a list of qualifiers first. Is this job worth the pay difference? Uh, is, is this career change, is it going to provide you enough time with your friends and family? Because uh, it's, life is more than money. Uh, if, is this going to be something that you enjoy doing day in and day out, or are you going to hate your life doing this job? See, there's more to, to, to making money and getting any job you can. If you're looking for a spouse, most definitely have some qualifiers going into it. There are more, there, there's more to a relationship than just attraction. Are, are, you, are you guys compatible personality-wise? Nobody actually brings this up much, but do you fight well? Because you're going to get in arguments with, with your spouse. Are you, do you fight well with each other? Can you see this person being the, the parent to your child? And most importantly, if you're a Christian, I would definitely put this on the choir, qualifier list, is does that person share the same spiritual values as you? Because that will become a bigger issue down the line. So make godly decisions by using some common sense and narrow down the options. Now, the fourth step, and this is what the, the disciples did in, in trying to choose a replacement for, uh, for, for Judas, it is this, place more weight on God's will than your will. See, when making godly decisions, you can pray about it, you can, you can study the scriptures about it. You, you can use common sense. You can even know exactly that this is God's will for your life. But if you put more weight on your own will than his, then it doesn't matter because you're going to choose what you want to do over what God wants you to do. And so you need to put more weight on God's will first. See, the decision to choose who's going to replace uh, Judas, uh, either Justice or, or Matthias, the early church truly prioritized God's will over their own. In, in verse 24, it reads uh, that they prayed this, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. See, they're saying, Lord, you know our hearts. You know who we want uh, between the two. And likely, many of the, the, the church disciples then, they probably did not agree Completely. They probably, some wanted this guy, one probably favored the other guy. But in the end, they're saying, God, you know our hearts. You know our preferences, what we personally want. But beyond what we want, we want your will over ours. Now, can we truly say that about every aspect in our lives? God, we want your will over our own will. You see, God, this is, this is my, my personal preference. This is what I want in uh, how I spend my money. God, th this is what I want. This is my personal preference in how I want to date and how I want to do relationships. God, this is my personal preference of how I want to speak to others. God, this is my personal preference in what I want to, to how I should handle this conflict in my life. But you know what? What I want, I want it to be second to what you want. I want what I want, my will, my desires, my preferences to take the back seat, and I want you to take the steering wheel, the front seat. And so would your will weigh heavier than my own will? You see, knowing God's will is half the battle. Doing God's will is the other half. Anybody get the G.I. Joe reference? <laughs> Wisdom is knowing and doing the right thing. Do, do you know the motivator, uh, what the motivator is in order to, to place God's will uh, more heavier, more, that there's more weight on his will than your own? You know what that motivator is to do that, to make that switch? Love. It's all about love. Love is the key. John 14, 15, Jesus tells him straight, directly, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, if you love someone, automatically you're going to do the things that the other person likes and it makes him happy, right? When I was dating Joyce, my wife, when we were dating, I, I did things that I did not like to do, but I did it because she liked it, right? Like dancing. I suck at dancing. I don't like dancing. She loves dancing. 
So I took a dancing class, but hot yoga. I would never in my life get caught doing hot yoga. But she was into it at the time, and I did it. But it's two way because it made her happy. She did. She she knew that I liked free diving and surfing, and so she tried doing free diving and surfing. And she doesn't even know how to swim at the time. She had to take swimming classes. You see, it's a two way street. If you love somebody, you automatically do the things that make them happy. And so love is the key for doing God's will, because if you love Him, if you love God, you'll automatically put more weight on his will, the things that make him happy. So fall in love with God. And if you have not fallen in love with God yet, I encourage you that it is the most incredible, deepest, greatest love that you can ever experience this side of heaven. And if you might have fallen away from God at one point, I encourage you with the words from Revelation that to return to your first love. Go back to your first love and how you started your relationship with God in the beginning. And God will always take you back no matter how bad you feel, no matter how far you've sailed. He will always take you back with open arms. The, the key is love. And lastly, the fifth step, last step to making godly decisions, it's seek confirmation and take action. Seek confirmation and take action. Now. This last step for making godly decisions, uh, the early church, uh, in, they were trying to find a replacement for Judas. They sought confirmation. However, they did it in a way that might seem strange to us today. Uh, we read in verse 26 that they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, today when we read that, we go, they cast lots? Like what, they, they drew straws? What they do, flip a coin? Like left, left at the chance? That's how they chose the next disciple? Now, for us, that sounds really strange. However, that practice of casting lots in the Old Testament was customary. And it showed up uh, over 70 times in scriptures. The Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothes after he was crucified. The sailors cast lots to determine that it was Jonah running from God that was causing the storm because he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Uh, there was many ways in the Old Testament they, that they chose to seek confirmation of God's will that, that seemed strange to us. There was a time in uh, with a guy named Gideon. God gave him a directive, and, and he was like, are you sure, Lord? Uh, I need confirmation on this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay this fleece out, and in the morning, can you make the morning dew, make the fleece wet, and the ground around it dry? And so in the morning came, that's what happened. And he's like, oh, I need more confirmation, Lord. Let's try it again, but opposite. Let's flip it. This time, when I wake up, I'll lay the fleece down, and why don't you keep the fleece dry and the ground around it wet? And so he went to sleep, and it was so. You see, there, there's, all, there's all these ways that in the Old Testament, they sought to find confirmation uh, of what God's will is that we're not accustomed to as believers today. Uh, but the, the, the main thing, and the, the main idea of why they did it was so that they would remove any human bias from the equation and that they would rely on God himself. And the main point of why they did these things was so that they can seek confirmation, that they can know this is what God is telling us. And God would use those things in those days uh, to give them confirmation. Pro Proverbs 16, verse 33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is the Lord's. See, now let me be clear. I am not advocating drawing straws or flipping coins or casting lots to determine God's will for your life today. That was something they did in the Old Testament. Today, it's completely different. You see, today we have the complete canon of Scripture, and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and that is our guide. See, see uh, th th this situation in Acts uh, is the last time that we ever hear about casting lots in, in the Bible. Uh, because what happened next was the church received the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that next week as we enter, uh, during Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit came down and started to dwell with the disciples in the early church. And from that point, the church became spirit-led. Uh, the Spirit would guide them and confirm what the Lord's will is. So today, we have two main sources of confirmation in making godly decisions. Number one, is scriptures, and we already talked about that, how, how to study the scriptures, that God will use the scriptures to confirm 
what his will is in your life. 2 Timothy verse 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may complete, be, be complete, equipped for every good work. Now the second uh, thing that we have for confirmation of what God's will is, is the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit now to lead us and guide us and confirm what, the, what God's will is. See, Jesus modeled this uh, in his early ministry. See, Jesus was one with the Spirit. And, and in Mark 1, it, it, it says that the Spirit drove him, Jesus, into the wilderness, started directing him where to go. Receiving the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, now Pentecost means 50. Uh, if Pentecost happens 50 days after Passover, um, if, you, if you recall, Jesus stayed with the disciples after his resurrection for 40 days, and then he ascended, and the Pentecost happened on the 50th day. So this is happening in this in-between 10-day period of, of not having the Holy Spirit. But we'll learn next week, what happened when the Holy Spirit uh, arrived and dwelled within the, the church and the disciples? Now, after that, the disciples, uh, and, and all throughout Acts, we see how the Holy Spirit was leading the church. And I'm going to show you, uh, all throughout, I'm going to give you a flash forward of, of our, our Acts series and how the Spirit was leading uh, the disciples. Acts 8, it says, the Spirit said to Philip, go. The Spirit said go. Acts 10, verse 19, while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, rise and go. The Spirit is the one directing. Acts 11, verse 12, the Spirit told me to go. Uh, and then Acts 13, it says, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. The Spirit is guiding the church all throughout this early period of their growth. Uh, Acts 13, they were being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Acts 15, 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit uh, and to us to lay on you no greater burden. Uh, Acts 16, verse 6 and they went through the region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's telling them to go and telling them not to go. Acts 19, uh, Paul resolved by the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and go to Jerusalem. In Acts 20, on and on, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. On and on, throughout, the, 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 throughout Acts and this early phase of the church, the Holy Spirit is guiding. The Holy Spirit is confirming what direction and what that will is that they should go. See, the Holy Spirit is a pivotal deci uh, part of making deci the decision process. Uh, John 16, verse 13 says, He, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Now, those are the two ways, two main ways to find confirmation decision. I'm going to give you a third one. It's a bonus one. Through godly counsel. Through godly counsel. That maybe it's a pastor or a leader or a strong Christian friend uh, that you can talk to. God uses godly counsel to help guide you. Now, personally, for me, in my life, I have employed all these, these five steps. Uh, the prayer, studying the scripture, uh, using common sense. But, but I'd also fast. Because fasting focuses your spirit. And for me personally, when I have went to the Lord to find guidance in a direction, uh, what I would see is, is that, that there would be confirmation through repetition. That, that uh, a verse would come alive and pop out of the scriptures and, and come from different sources independently where I would be in my devotionals and God would speak to me through a verse and then my, my mentor, would, who's a godly person, would say the same thing and then I'd turn on the radio and uh, listen to a, a podcast and it's the same exact thing. And what I found in my life personally is that when things are being repeated, that's a time for me to pay attention that maybe God is trying to tell me something. Now, that worked that way for me. It might work differently for you. But in many cases, you, you, look, we're never going to get 100% confirmation. Well, we might not get 100% confirmation on a single choice, but you can get a high degree of certainty and make a wise decision uh, and take action on the decision. And that's the other side of this is you take action. You need to take action. That completes the steps. Now, those are the five steps of making godly decisions. I want to speak briefly now on a certain school of thought regarding, regarding the decision to choose Matthias as a replacement for Judas. Now, th there are some that argue that Matthias was actually the wrong choice, that it should have been the Apostle Paul. Uh, 
Now, personally, uh, after researching both, both arguments um, of the for and against why Matthias was either the, the right choice or the wrong choice, I personally think that, that Matthias was not a mistake, that he was the right choice for that time. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, wouldn't have been a Christian at that time and probably and wouldn't have been ready for ministry for a few years later. But I started to play the what-if game. What if Matthias actually was the wrong choice? What if the disciples actually made the wrong decision in this case? And I teased it out, and you know where I came to? I came to this. It would have been fine. It would have been fine if they made a mistake. Why? Because even if they made a mistake, we serve a God that works all things together for good, for those who serve him and love him and are called to his purpose. And so look, we're never going to bat a thousand. We're never going to be a hundred percent. We might make some wrong choices and bad decisions at some point. But as a Christian, we serve a God that promises to turn our mistakes around and make them good, uh, to, to turn our sorrows of yesterday into the joys of today. And so maybe you might have made a mistake in your life, in your past. You might have made a mistake, a wrong decision that you regret. And I want to tell you here, Christian, Christian, it will be okay. It's going to be okay because there is no mistake that he cannot fix. There is nothing he cannot change. There is nothing he cannot repair. God has all power and control to repair every mistake we have made if we will let him. My mom used to always say this. It's burned in my mind. There is no regrets in this Christian life. So starting to trust God that he would work all things together for good that he will take your mistakes and make them good if we have the faith to let go. And there's a quote that I read uh, during my studies, and, and, and this is such a powerful quote. It says that God doesn't let you change your past, but he will let your past change your future. And he will let it change your future for the good, because that's what he has for you. And so I pray that you will make the right decisions in your life. Now I want to end with this story. There is a pastor, his name was Philip Johnson, and in 1969, he was commissioned and ordained to be a pastor of a church located in, in the northern coast of Newfoundland, Canada. Now, now that's up in the rural area. It's, it's very cold and snows all the time. It's a very difficult place to travel. And the church that he began pastoring was not a normal church. It was one large church with 10 smaller satellite campuses. And he would have to have a circuit ministry where he would have to visit each of the different areas. Uh, and, and, and some of these areas were very difficult to reach. And first he questioned if this was the right kind of church for him to pastor. And the Holy Spirit confirmed to him. And he said, yes, it is you. This is the right decision. And so Johnson... He learned that in order to get to the smallest of the churches, he would have to travel 40 miles by snowmobile to get to a tiny village. Now, now traveling that distance on a snowmobile uh, in the cold in that terrain was not an easy feat. And so on the day that he had to go, he started second-guessing himself and thought, ah, maybe, maybe it's all right if they miss a week. That's a, that's a hard travel. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and, and led him to the right decision, said, no, you need to go. You need to go today. And so he made the trek. He made the trek 40 miles on a snowmobile in the snow. And when Johnson arrived uh, at the church, there was only one person there. And it was a fisherman that also had to travel 20 miles just to get there. And so Johnson originally thought, uh, okay, there's only, there's only one guy here. Maybe we just like pray for each other. I'll pray for him and then call it a day. But then the Holy Spirit started to lead him and, and say, no, no, you need, to, you need to do more. And common sense moved him because he realized like, he had to travel 40 miles. The other guy had to travel 20 miles. That's 60 miles we both had to travel. And then we got 60 miles that we both have to travel on our way back. So might as well make it count. And, and so Johnson did the full service as if there were 100 people in the room. He, he did it all. He did hymns, he, he did the readings, he did the prayers, he did the sermon, the Lord's Supper, and the benediction as if the, the room was full. And during the sermon, Johnson was wondering, why, why did he even bother to do that? Because the fisherman that was standing there didn't even put his head up the entire time. But when Johnson greeted the fisherman at the door when he was leaving to thank him for coming, 
Johnson received a pleasant surprise. The fisherman told him this, Reverend, I've been thinking about becoming a Christian for about 30 odd years, and today was the day. You see, when the Holy Spirit leads your decisions, when he leads where you should go and you listen and heed the call, he will lead you into places that will change your life and change other people's lives for his kingdom. It will spread the kingdom of God. And so, live a life that makes godly decisions. That, that, that you will take your will and, and place it second behind God's will. That you will, you will start with prayer and that you will, you will get confirmation through scripture and through the Holy Spirit. And if, you tr- if we truly are the sum of all our choices, then making godly decisions like the disciples did in their first major decision will change your life for the better. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you made the decision to save us. Lord, we thank you that you made the decision to send your son down to earth. That your son made the decision to go to the cross in our place. God, we thank you that you chose us. And our response is that we have to love you back because you loved us first. And so if if you're here today and you have never made the decision to make Jesus your Lord, this is the most important decision that you can ever make in your life because it affects your eternity. And this is your valley of decision. And if that's you, if God's tugging and calling on your heart that now is the time to step over that line, pray this simple prayer. It's not mystical or magical. It's just an honest heart speaking to a loving God and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for deciding to go to the cross for me. Thank you for deciding to love me when I didn't deserve it. I want to decide to make you Lord of my life. I want to decide to accept your free gift of salvation. Holy Spirit, would you live inside of me and change me from the inside out? God, would you take the steering wheel of my life? Be the leader and Lord of my life from this day forth. I thank you. I praise you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.